Hello, and welcome to another episode of Boundless Body Radio. I'm your host, Casey Ruff, and today we have another amazing guest introduced to you now. Kirstie Woods is a registered exercise physiologist and founding practitioner at Metabolic Health Solutions, headquartered in Perth, Australia. Metabolic Health Solutions is a highly successful Australian company that provides the technology, systems, and solutions that help people lose weight, keep it off, and improve their metabolic health. They are led by an experienced global management team and has several happy customers across Australia, Europe, and Asia. Kirstie now has helped more than 1,000 people improve their metabolic health. With over 10 years of experience in the health industry, she understands the complexity of obesity and related comorbidities and the frustrations and challenges it can pose. Kirsty takes a very hands-on approach with clients and gets great satisfaction when they achieve long-term goals. Her specialty areas include healing obesity, PCOS, diabetes, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, fatigue, infertility, and sleep apnea, which are all common health issues associated with a poor metabolism. Kirsty primarily leverages technology, including the use of the same type of metabolic carts that I use very successfully in my own career. You can find Kirsty Woods on Twitter at LowCarbEP. Kirsty Woods, what an absolute honor it is to welcome you to Balanced Body Radio. Thanks so much for reaching out and having me. I look forward to talking all things metabolism and whatever else comes along. So much fun. I could talk about this for hours and hours and hours. You can imagine how excited I got when I came across a podcast that you were hosted on. And I'm listening to another person who's into the low carbohydrate space. And they're also into metabolic, doing metabolic tests. It's amazing. I got so excited. I reached out immediately. So glad we put this on the calendar. It's a real honor to be able to talk with you today. Not a problem. Yeah, I'm really excited. And as you say, is it's really good when you have some of the data and the technology to guide and um, back up and motivate patients for what you're actually doing. Yeah, really amazing. We got some people some really, really, really good results over the years as we were learning how to interpret the results to be better and better. And I want to address all of that with you today. But first of all, let's learn about you. How did you get interested in health? So I, um, when I finished school, I didn't really know what I wanted to do, actually, but I knew I was always active, loved health, um, so did exercise physiology here in Australia. And when I finished, I... I still didn't really know what I want to do. Everyone aspires to work with athletes and those sorts of things. And um, I find myself being reached out by Metabolic Health Solutions, with a, which was a um, small um, data and technology company to do with metabolism. And essentially, it was a really good opportunity. So that was oh, 11 years ago now. So I've never really looked back. Um, I've learned so much every day is a school day. And just being reintroduced to a technology we learned about at uni that you thought was only for research. And I can realise, hey, I can use this in, in real people in the clinic and hopefully have a big impact and teach others to um, contribute to that bigger picture because of these issues that you mentioned before related to metabolism. But like blood pressure, you don't guess blood pressure, you test it. Yet all of these diseases which you mentioned before and also now coming to light, um, things like lipedema, fibromyalgia, you might have a metabolic component, but we're just guessing. Yeah, everything we're learning about mental health, all the Alzheimer's and dementia and Parkinson's we're learning also may have a very strong metabolic component to it. It really is kind of what seems to be what ails us these days. Yeah, and that's what's really exciting um, in the clinic, but obviously reaching out to researchers, um, looking at things that... Uh, unexplored territory we know you have a metabolic component so we know that for example something I'm sure we'll get into is um, level of fat burning um, and some, through something called RQ you can actually predict um, diabetes and metabolic syndrome we now know that but you know what's the ramifications for example um, we know that gestational diabetes is on the rise and people need to go through those horrible glucose tolerance tests is there an easier way to screen or or maybe predict so that we, we don't have those negative consequences? And same with Alzheimer's. We know that there's changes in the metabolism in the brain 10 years before symptoms start occurring. So if we can focus on that prevention, you know, who knows what impact we can have, really? Yeah, that's really exciting. I'm thinking about the movie that came out on Netflix several years ago called The Magic Pill. And I believe they were yes. in the western part of Australia where they were asking a group of Aboriginals, like, how do you guys die now? 
and they all say like, oh, well, we die of obesity and diabetes and all these diseases, all the ones that you listed, very metabolic in nature. They said, how did your parents die? And that was more like, oh, I think they got infections or tuberculosis or that kind of thing. And it was like, well, what about the generations before that? And they kind of sat around and looked at each other and they said, well, I, I think they died either of old age or, or they got injured or childbirth. And so clearly something is going on metabolically. We have changed the way we live, and I would submit the way we eat so drastically in such a short amount of time that these diseases that were just exceedingly rare in the past are now everywhere. You can't go anywhere without seeing it all around you. It's almost hard to find an exception. Yeah, and I think um, obviously the magic pill and um, the local Indigenous community is something close to my heart. Um, I did some work with them um, during PRAC during university as well, is they are unfortunately predisposed because they've had even less exposure to some of those um, environmental changes um, that we talked about. But once again, the good news is that film shows and many others is it's not stuck in stone. There is plenty that can be done. And if it, this area is of interest, um, exercise physiologist Ray Kelly here in Australia doing amazing stuff in these populations with diabetes reversal. So wow, definite shout fantastic. out to the work he's doing. That's amazing. Yeah, we'll make sure we link him in the show notes. That's fantastic. Before we get into the tool of, of and, and, you know, metabolic testing, let's talk about the breath itself. Why is understanding the breath so important for us understanding health? So essentially, um, taking us back to our chemistry days, when we look at breath, it can give really good insights as to what's happening with inside the body, which we just assume at the moment. And what we're looking at here is oxygen, or well, number one, oxygen. And what essentially happens inside the body is we take in oxygen, combine that with food within the cells in something called our mitochondria, which are powerhouses of the cells. And that gives us energy as well as waste products. And that's the, the chemical equation um, that we have a look at. And another waste product is CO2, which, lo and behold, we can look at in our breath. So by looking at those two gases, we can see not only, you know, how fast or slow our metabolism is, but at rest, it can tell us what fuels we're burning. And the reason being is the body's designed to burn fat. It's majority fat. It's a quite a clean fuel source. It doesn't give off much CO2 or max emissions like a car. Um, so the ratio of oxygen to carbon dioxide is relatively low. Yet when we burn carbohydrates, which going back to our ancestors was designed for when we had to run away from a tiger, we do use it. This is a term called metabolic flexibility. But now, unfortunately, we use that all the time. It builds up byproducts such as ROS, which doesn't help our health and inflammation, and it gives us more CO2. So we don't use as much oxygen, we give off more CO2, and the ratio of those fuels is a lot different. It's one, one to one. So we can get some really good insights as to what's happening with inside the body. Yeah, I love that. Okay, so let me let me continue with the analogy. Um, and let's say the way you described with car, I love that description. So let's say I was in Perth and I wanted to get to Melbourne for the Formula One race in March. I would want to get there as efficiently as possible. I would want to use the least amount of energy or fuel. I'd want to produce the least amount of emissions. I'd want a very efficient car to make that long drive between the two cities. Now, once you get there, you watch a race with the, some of the fastest cars on earth. And these cars rev, they, they, they like idle and rev at like 16,000 RPMs. They consume massive amounts of fuel. And you don't run them all the time. You only run them for races because it's really destructive. Now, either one has a lot of benefits, right? Like you want to be efficient. You want to do that probably most of the time and have less of that, like, you know, engine buildup of, of, of gunk, in, you know, from energy burning. If you're burning a clean fuel for the efficient car with the race car, you also want that too, because you need those occasional periods where you need to run away from something. But if you're revving that engine all the time, that's not going to be good. Exactly. And that's um, what we see a lot of the time in the clinic, um, particularly when we focus just on metabolic rate, not how we're generating that energy, is a lot of people actually don't have a slow metabolism. It might be higher, but they're like that inefficient car. They're burning through a lot of fuel, and that's why they become fatigued and all those other side effects that can come from it. And also another reason why we we test at rest, which 
um, we've got some people using our metabolic cart called eCal in the UK that are using it on athletes. And I said, oh, but you want to know during performance. And they came back at me and interestingly said, yes, but even athletes spend most time at rest. So similar is we need to get that right before we do those hot VA laps. Um, it impacts sleep, recovery and performance in those athletes. So particularly in the populations I'm dealing with, um, chronic disease, rest is most important. But even for the athletes, um, it's really important not to neglect that troop over, as you say. Yeah, totally agree with you. Okay, so we're going to come back to the lifestyle factors that really make a difference in all of this later. But let's go now to the tool itself. Tell us what is a metabolic cart. So it goes by the name of indirect calorimetry. Um, and it's it's been used in research for a while. So if you look at any obesity papers um, and also in athletes, um, it has been used for a long time. However, it's due to ex expense and calibration needs, which you mentioned before, it's not been used in the clinic that much. And that's what um, myself and obviously Metabolic Health Solutions are passionate about. Let's bring this technology, which gives cut such key data, to those that need it most. And I'm biased. I don't think it's the elite athletes or the lucky 10 people that get to go on an obesity research. Um, so it has those two sensors we mentioned before, the oxygen and the carbon dioxide sensor. So we're measuring in the atmosphere, there's 21% oxygen, and we measure what you're breathing out as well as those waste products. Um, so that's how we get the information we're getting from. Uh, it's about a five to 10 minute breathing test with the cart that we use, um, using specialised sensors um, that are, are designed to be nice and stable over time, um, maybe for going some of the issues that we see in research or, or you mentioned before. Um, but yeah, there's different types. So in a hospital setting, for example, they might use a ventilated hood to get the requirements for someone who can't talk from themselves to make sure they're not underfeeding them, which can have severe complications when you're trying to recover from something. Um, we use a mouthpiece for ours in terms of ease of use, less, a little bit claustrophobic for, for most patients. Um, and generally people find it, it can feel a little bit weird, but generally people find the test um, quite non-invasive and, and easy to do, um, which means the power can be that it can be reassessed regularly. So some of these changes can occur within three to five days. Um, so bringing some really powerful data and, and feedback to the patient. Yeah, that's fantastic. Now, we, we had two different versions of the test that we were running. One was a resting version, and one we called the active metabolic assessment, which is more like what people would associate with like a VO2 max kind of a test. Yeah. And, and more people would want to do the active version because it looked it looked sexier. That's what I see on the Gatorade commercial, and it looks fun. I want to see my performance, and that's great. We use that to help people get really, really good results. But I always made the argument that, you know what, the resting test is not as sexy. It doesn't look as cool, but you're going to get more information out of that test than you will on the other test. What do you think? Do you agree with that? Yeah. And as I said, is there is value, um, particularly maybe for athletes in training zones and um, those sorts of things at the higher end, but particularly with the populations I deal with, is when we have a look at the breakdown of what contributes to metabolism and our energy expenditure. 70 to 80%, particularly in the sedentary populations, is our resting metabolism. So that's going to have the biggest bang for its buck um, when it particularly comes to chronic disease management, the sleep, the fatigue, the recovery, all those things we mentioned before, even in athletes, but it's not to say that it can't be used in conjunction. That's just yeah. been my personal experience. Yeah, no, that's great. You mentioned earlier that this test is often used in, in you know, studies and things like that. And I think most people would remember the study that came out in 2016 with the Biggest Loser contestants. And they showed they actually did the test and they did the test six years after the contest was done. These people on average, everybody knows they regained weight. They, they regained most of their weight on average and their metabolic rate never 
really recovered from that. And that was that, that study was done using these same metabolic carts. And so when you're saying it's actually used in big studies, it actually is. And it's really interesting to validate what's going on when somebody is losing weight the correct way versus somebody that's losing weight in a way that they're going to rebound. Yeah, um, I think it's important to note that that data helps to explain some of the physiology as to why. And so when we understand that, we can put things in place. So in the clinic, one of the things I'm looking at is making sure their metabolic rate isn't declining. I'm not waiting six years later after they've regained all that weight to find out, um, as well as maintaining their muscle mass is uh, also really key there. Yeah. And on that note, um, just interjecting is, you know, now, for example, we see a lot of bariatric surgery, uh, particularly here in Australia. So they use this technology and one of the researchers looking at those who got the best results from bariatric surgery and those that regained. And what they found is those that didn't have metabolic flexibility with poor fat burners at rest actually got poorer outcomes. So this can teach us a lot once again is if we get people right before they go for surgery, whether it's something like bariatric surgery or even knee surgery, if they've got less inflammation, more metabolically flexible, they're going to recover better and get better outcomes. So I found that really interesting that this technology, as I said, has been used in research with the changing times and changing methods um, and can provide a lot of insight to what's going on. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I observe that like when people go and get these surgeries, like you, you're not excused from the work. You still have metabolic work that you need to do. And yeah, you should get the surgery if you've done that work. But if you haven't, it, you're going to go back to where you were and you might cause some severe metabolic damage. So I love that you made that point. You said something earlier I want to circle back to. You mentioned that our resting metabolic rate or the number that you're measuring for our metabolism is only a certain percentage of our calories. It is a majority of the calories that we burn in a day. Why is it a majority of the calories? I think most people think, well, well, the majority of the calories that I burn is when I go to the gym for an hour every single day and run on a treadmill. And that is not even close to being accurate. Can you tell us why our resting metabolic rate is the greater percentage of the calories we burn and where the other calories burn, where other calorie burns come from, but why they may not add up as much as people think? Yeah, really great question. So that resting metabolism, our energy goes to all the things that we do to keep us alive. So everything from breathing, the, the cell um, making energy, as well as, um, you know, the brain using fuel, all those sorts of things that we do unconsciously. Then the other contributing factors is, as we say, exercise. And also we take a small amount of generally about 10% to break down the food in the gut does require some energy. So all that being said is often why we have patients who are really motivated slogging out in the gym and sometimes not getting the results they desire, not due to lack of work. And it's because they might be, you know, burning calories in the gym, but at even at rest, they're burning glucose instead of fat. And they go to a high-intensity workout, they're going to burn more glucose. So what that might look like is they might be fatigued, they might be hungry after a workout, and their physiology has a response saying, let's eat more. And as I said, is that's why, unfortunately, if the uh, equations are accurate, is they might not be burning as much as they expected because the main state is they're resting. And also there is some compensatory mechanisms afterwards because of their physiology, depending on what they're burning yeah. as well. Have I missed out any key elements there? No, that's fantastic. I mean, thinking about that person who's doing, like you said, no lack of work in the gym. They are working very, very hard. They look like a puddle of sweat in the gym. They're running on the treadmill and they're mouth breathing at a very high heart rate. And they, they, they want, why can't I lose weight? Why am I still retaining visceral fat? Why do I feel cold in my extremities? Why am I experiencing sugar cravings? And why does my weight loss seem to completely plateau five or six weeks after I start this new program trying to lose weight? Like it happens every time. And that's when the weight gain starts again. So yeah, that was perfectly explained. We're talking here about resting metabolic rate. Some people might hear that and say, well, I know about basal metabolic rate. Can you explain the difference between the two and why, you know, they're, they're very similar, but for practical reasons, we choose to really focus on resting metabolic rate. Yeah, so basal metabolic rate is essentially after a 12 hour rest. So you're in a complete state 
of doing nothing, which, as I said, might be the most accurate as to what the body does in that state. But when we think about our, our daily lives, that's not how we spend most of it. Um, and also in terms of testing, it's not very practical to get people to do so. So what um, specifically the protocol we use, a four-hour fast, end of a meal cycle, so all the insulin should be cleared, everyone should be burning fat, as well as um, no exercise the morning before uh, as well. They should be in a relatively resting state. It should be about 10% within that um, basal metabolic rate and more and most importantly, repeatable over time so we can assess the change. Yeah, I know you use electrical impedance to measure body fat as well. And it's the same thing. You want to keep the conditions exactly the same as best you can every time so that you've got a good baseline. So, okay, that's really well explained. When, when somebody uses a bioelectrical impedance um, machine, for example, they might see a readout that shows their resting metabolic rate or their basal metabolic rate. And they might look at that number and say, okay, well, I, all I had to do was stand on the scale. This gave me everything I need. Why do I need to go see Kirsty? Can you explain what the difference is between indirect calorimetry, like you mentioned, and, and you know what, what is popping up on a body fat scale? Absolutely. Now, what that is, is, so even taking a step back, is you can have a look at your metabolic rate or predict your metabolic rate by looking at your age, height, and gender. There are some formulas out there. There's a study, a study that was done a while ago by Foster, and he had a look at middle-aged females. They should have all had about the same metabolic rate according to these equations. They vary dramatically by 30% over, 30% under. So if you're overfeeding someone by 30%, they're not going to lose weight. If you're underfeeding them, they're going to be tired, hungry, and not really stick to it. So once again, this is one of the fall downs of the equations, similar to BMI. Great for populations at an individual liver level can be very misleading, and it doesn't tell you anything about fat burning either. Now, with the bioelectrical impedance, what that does is add muscle mass and fat mass to that equation, depending on what you're using. So it adds in another factor, which might be a little bit more accurate, but it cannot take into account genetics, hormones, medication, lifestyle, all those other things which have a huge impact on metabolism. So that brings us to indirect calorimetry. What we're looking at is, as I said, the gold standard, what's happening in the body as a whole. Yeah. So particularly for the populations that we deal with that aren't going to be the norm, that's why it's necessary. Yeah, I love that. No, we would, on our reports, we would show that, you know, according to, I think it was the Harris-Benedict formula based on age, height, yeah. weight, and gender, it might be this average, this is the average for your, you know, demographic, your age, height, weight, and gender should be somewhere in here. I do agree that bioelectrical impedance scales do a better job because they assume based on your muscle mass, which should be a little bit more metabolically active, that might give you a better number and at least get you thinking about resting metabolic rate. And I appreciate that. But yeah, we saw wide variances in metabolic rates when we were measuring. It was way more valuable to actually conduct the test. And and yeah, like I, it, I was used to using the example of saying like, what, if we took the average pant size of everybody in America and gave everybody that size pants, like that would be the average, but it would probably not fit very many people. It might only fit like 10% of people because it is only an average. Exactly. I think that's really good. And it's important to note when they came up with these metabolic equations, um, they used specific populations. It was generally Caucasian populations who were at university. So you can see how they might skew the results as well. Yeah, okay. And, and again, I do find some value in knowing what the equation is because it gives me at least a ballpark of where I think somebody's metabolic rate should be. So somebody who is healthy metabolically, what things would you expect to see as far as their results after they complete their test? In terms of the metabolism test? Yeah, in terms of what, what, what are you expecting on the readout to be able to tell somebody, like, like somebody burning lots of calories or not very many calories, or is somebody really metabolically healthy burning both fats and carbohydrates, a majority of one? Like, what would you expect to see and be able to talk to that person about after the test? Somebody who is metabolically healthy. Yeah, great question. So what I would generally expect, and I um, personally focus on the fat and carbohydrates first, because that can dictate 
how efficient they are, how much fuel they're burning and those sorts of things as well. So what it means by being metabolically healthy is that ability to switch between the two. So at rest, that would be burning about 80% fat, 20% glucose. Their metabolic rate, as I said, would generally be within expected limits, um, sometimes maybe a little bit higher. If it's too extreme, maybe, you know, we might want to have a look at things like hyperthyroid, um, stress and those sorts of things. And then if it's too low, that's hypothyroidism. Or maybe they're very efficient. It's actually really interesting. Um, not myself personally, but some people have had a look at particularly aerobic athletes. And the, the way the oxygen flows into the cells is great. So like that car analogy, they're not burning a lot of fuel. So the metabolic rate might be perceived as low, but it's not a bad thing because when we have a look at their efficiency, it's actually really good. So they're the sorts of things I might look at and see for the patient. And sometimes it's really good to see that you're on the right track. But what's also really interesting is judging a book by its cover, sometimes we see these fit people, even athletes, and they look really fit and healthy and we test them and it might not be the case. So when we delve deeper based on this information, we talk about their sleep, their recovery, um, you know, their iron status, their carbohydrate loading. And because they're doing all this exercise and they look fit, they, they assume they can get away with a lot. Um, so one example, I've had a, a triathlete with fatty liver, not burning wow. fat. So once again is... On the flip side is you can also have someone who's really overweight um, but might not have those diabetes and high blood pressure and all those things associated, and they can actually also be metabolically healthy. It does reduce the risk, but obviously the, the extra weight does put burden on their joints and everything else. So something else to consider, but um, once again, what metabolically healthy could look like. Yeah. So if I'm interpreting those results, generally speaking, I'm looking at this person saying like, what well, this looks good. Everything is in range. I'm assuming that everything that you're doing is contributing to your health. I would love to see you sometime down the road. But, in, you know, if, if you continue to live the way that you're living, you're, you're probably going to do a really good job. And, and yeah, we might want to retest them once a year, once every six months, just to see how, you know, things are maintaining. But assuming they don't make any major changes, I would expect that person to live a very healthy metabolic life. Would you agree? Yeah, definitely. And like you say, six monthly, like a dental checkup, just because we know that, for example, poor fat burning can predict future weight gain. So even if they haven't gained the weight yet, if we can monitor and pick it up early, we can prevent a lot of issues down the track. Yep. But also it depends on their goals. If they present to me and, for example, maybe they are overweight um, or they've got some gut issues, those sorts of things, um, getting a bit older and they are metabolically flexible, do have access to their fat stores, what we might recommend is something like fasting. And the reason is they can, for example, skip breakfast or skip dinner and have their own body fat for breakfast or dinner. So what they're getting is they're not depriving of fuel. They're not going to get starvation signals. They're not going to decline their metabolic rate. But they're accessing their own fat stores so that they can help to lose weight, but also in terms of um, anti-aging. They're not putting that extra stress of processing the food and those sorts of things um, and allowing their, their time to concentrate on maybe healing the gut as opposed to digesting the food, which we, we do during all waking hours, unfortunately, these days. Yeah, totally. I love the concept of having your own body fat for breakfast. I love that. And we're going to come back to fasting because that was the one thing that really sent me hard into low carbohydrate space. So we'll talk about that in a second. Before we do, I want to talk about two other scenarios that I saw quite commonly. Um, one is an over-exerciser, let's say somebody who does a lot of cardio in particular, maybe they're an athlete and they're trying to become efficient. If you're you know, running 26.2 miles, you would love to be very efficient when you did that. So we'll leave the athletes aside. Let's just say generally a female, I saw more in females than males. They are doing a lot of cardio. They're doing a lot of circuit classes. They're doing a lot of HIIT and they are doing the diet and they did every diet and they have done every diet and will continue to do every diet. 
and they struggle with all kinds of different health issues, even though they're working out a lot, they're burning tons of calories while they exercise, and they're eating a calorie-restricted diet. Can you tell me what you would expect to see on their metabolic results when you get their printout? Yeah, and I think you hit the nail on the head. These are some of the populations that I see, whether it be middle-aged menopausal females who were brought up in that era, but also, um, you know, postpartum mums, and they're trying really hard. They want to be healthy for their kids. And they just come to the clinic just fatigued, pulling their hair out. And and you know what is very interesting? Sometimes with these results that we see, and as I said, sometimes they have a high metabolic rate. They're stressed. So what that might look like in their metabolic results, I just don't mean mentally stressed, physiologically stressed. So that could be when you're sick, you tend to burn glucose as opposed to fat. That's what we're seeing in these patients. They're not very efficient. Oxygen's not flowing into their cells. There might be some hormonal contributors. But once again, is there a little bit harder to fix? So if you work well with their lifestyle, that can have positive influences on the hormones and become a positive cycle as opposed to the negative one that we're seeing at the moment. So I've seen patients who have got very emotional. Once they've seen the results saying there's a reason behind why all that hard work is not paying off. And because they might go to a health professional and and because they're busy, they don't have time to um, sometimes keep up with the, the research and what's happening and everyone is different. It, it's very time-consuming. Um, they're just told to eat less and move more and the thought of that is unbearable. Um, so, you know, sometimes telling them to exercise less and focus on fueling their body right not only gets good results, and I've seen it time and time again, but just such a relief for the patient knowing that it's not a personal attribute. Yeah, yeah. So no, I, some of the results that we would see. Yeah, I agree. There's a reason we always kept a box of Kleenexes around our consultations because people do develop, I would almost argue, it's almost like an addiction to like really hard calorie burning workouts. And they don't want to hear that I've been spending an hour in the gym, six days a week, you know, wasting my time essentially, but there is a fix, which is the nice thing. We need to figure out how to increase your metabolic rate, which is probably suppressed, which is probably why you feel terrible. You've got terrible energy and you're not able to lose, I would say for sure, like weight around the midsection. And, and one nice proxy, I'll, I'll ask you this a few times for different things. One nice proxy for, you know, if you don't have access to some of this equipment, a metabolic cart, and you live in Timbuktu and you want to test this, get a cheap thermometer, like measure your temperature. You are going to be running cold. And this is why we could see the people coming up. I, I knew what their results were going to be. If you were wearing a jacket in July when it's, you know, 35 degrees Celsius outside, and you're always freezing and and you're always thinking about food and having those cravings. I know you have probably wrecked your metabolic rate and, and you probably need to restore fat burning as well. You're probably burning too many carbohydrates because you're experiencing so many cravings. Yeah, I think it's important to know in a lot of those cases that the metabolic rate isn't sometimes low. It's more so down to the body's not working as it's designed. It's burning carbohydrates instead of fat, which, as I said, creates a negative cycle, the cravings, the hunger, the fatigue those sorts of things. So sometimes we do see a slow metabolic rate, particularly um, after bariatric surgery or long-term starvation, but a lot of the time it is high because of that stress response. Yeah, gotcha. Okay, another scenario I want to present to you. This is now not somebody also who's metabolically healthy, but this is somebody who's very overweight or obese. This person consumes a lot of food, a lot of calories. They are probably consuming the wrong amounts of food. What things would you expect to see on their report? So similar to we know that if people are in starvation mode, their metabolic rate can go down. What we also know is it has a certain degree of compensatory mechanisms to go up as well. So sometimes we do see that high. So if someone's burning fat, but that metabolic rate is high, that is a good indication that maybe they're just eating too much, which is where fasting can come in. The more popular scenario is that, once again, sounding like a broken record, they're not burning fat and so what we can do there is okay well think about why might someone not be burning fat and, and I'm sure we're going to this later but we know that when the hormone insulin is high which is involved with diabetes but even years and years before that occurs insulin can be high hyperinsulinemia it can tell the body to burn glucose instead of fat so one way to help reduce that is reduce carbohydrate load and for an athlete, 
that might look like 150 grams of carbohydrates. For the general population, that look, might look like 20 to 50 grams of carbohydrates. So looking at the macronutrients for those individuals, getting them fat burning naturally can reduce their cravings, reduce their hunger, which are really commonly reported. So as opposed to trying to tell someone to calorie restrict, if we get the basics right, sometimes it becomes easier to do those other things that address the overeating as well. That, that, that's perfectly explained. Like for those people, that's really hopeful and helpful because they might have a suppressed metabolic rate. They might be burning tons of calories. And once we change the food and drop that insulin, the body finds all of the body fat and can start eating its own body fat for bre breakfast, which is incredible. And that was, and, go ahead. Oh, sorry um, to interrupt there. I think there's also now some data coming out. If those that do have a metabolic, slower metabolic rate, there's some data now showing that, once again, when you get the body um, metabolically flexible, reduced carbohydrate loads can actually increase metabolic rate to a certain extent. Um, we don't know purely the mechanisms, whether it's the ketones or it's the way the body's working. But a couple of hundred calor kilocalories can make a difference in the long run. So we had a look at some of our own data in a, a specific subset. Only about 10% had a slow metabolic rate. But of those, um, we looked at two visits and four visits to the clinic. Um, we seen an increase when they were put under some therapeutic carbohydrate restriction from about 15 to 20% over the, the shorter term and the longer term as well. So just a little side note to add in there. Perfect segue. Learning perfect from segue. The data. Yeah, <laughs> perfect segue. This is what got me into low carbohydrate. When I started leveraging the numbers and started showing people that first of all, we could drop their carbohydrates and then progressing and learning about keto and keto diets. We started pushing people a little bit more that way if we felt like they really needed it. And I would see it every time. The metabolic rate would not be normal anymore. It would be two or three or 400 calories higher. It was really nice. And you could flip somebody's fat burn. If somebody is burning a high amount of carbohydrates, like we said, you can teach them to burn a high amount of fat by not restricting their fat and restricting their carbohydrates. So I noticed exactly the same thing. And I started putting my people on those types of diets by and large, if I felt like that's what would really benefit them. And the fat burning results that we would get were phenomenal. We validated it using those scales, electrical impedance to measure body fat. We had people losing nearly 100% of their weight from fat, which is what you want to do. You say you want to lose weight. You don't want to lose weight. You want to lose fat. And we saw it over and over and over. It was magic. So just a couple of um, really interesting points and what you've seen is, as you rightly say, we want to be losing fat. So we want to look at muscle maintenance um, because that helps insulin sensitivity and blood sugar levels. It helps our joints, but it helps prevent regain. And that's really where exercise comes in. If we can maintain muscle, it helps weight regain down the track. So that's really important. What I also think is important from what we've been saying is similar to yourself is I didn't come in here with um, – the headspace is these are the kind of diets I'm going to use for these individuals. But by stumbling around, what I've seen is, is actually a very valuable tool, keyword being tool. It's not a one-size-fits-all approach and it doesn't help everyone, specifically those that might be burning more fat um, and metabolically flexible already. So we can have a look at, okay, well, what degree of carbohydrate restriction must, might they need depending on, on their results? And also it comes back to, you know, we see in the forums on Facebook all these low heart, low carbohydrate and ketogenic groups. Oh, it's not working for me. And it goes to show that it's not the be all and end all. There's the hormones, the pathology, the chronic diseases, other things. Um, we can't neglect things like sleep, which also impacts fat oxidation and cravings. The stress response, which there's always going to be stresses, but how we relate to that they're all going to have an impact as well. And we can't neglect those aspects. Thank you for bringing that up. That was going to be one, one of my questions for you is, did you come to this work with any preconceived notions of what diets would work best? Or were you kind of like me? Like you're giving me this tool. You're telling me to help these people improve their metabolisms. When I follow your advice to give people lots of grains and, and servings of fruit and all kinds of different, you know, goo gels and whatever as they're riding their bike, like they don't get good results. When I try this other thing, everybody is getting good results with the data. Like what, what, what do you want me to do? It sounds like your experience was kind of the same. Yeah, exactly. And I think in the first year, 
is I realised that everyone is their own equals and equals one, but also that university and, and studies teaches you how to learn, not what to learn. Um, particularly with the forever changing science and as I said, everyone's individuality. We've got to really, for any practitioner out there, go go in there with an open yet critical mindset. Um, yeah. So, for example, one of those examples for myself, I am um, quite passionate about using getting enough protein, which from my end is more bioavailable from real foods such as eggs and meat. Recognising that some people, um, due to religious beliefs or other reasons, might not like this approach, but the key is I have that data to say, hey, actually, you're doing enough. It may not be optimal, but who am I to say otherwise? You're burning fat, you're maintaining muscle, all those sorts of things. Um, so not the case for some people, but it can be used as an education tool yeah, to tell that. them otherwise. So once again, that open yet critical mindset. Um, I think is very, very valuable. And as I said, having the data to validate, educate, help me learn. I learn so much from patients every day. That's amazing. Yeah, that's amazing. So much there to learn if you're willing and able to be humble enough to accept new information. And this is where fasting comes in. Okay, so what, what I was accustomed to tell people when they were doing a resting test is your resting metabolic rate really should be like a baseline intake of calories. You really don't want to go any further in your intake of calories than your resting metabolic rate. That's the number of calories your body needs to kind of stay alive. Generally speaking, we're going to find a number that's higher than that number, even if you're trying to lose weight. Okay. I noticed that when people started going lower carb, maybe ketogenic, they would improve their metabolism and their fat burning would improve. Then people started fasting. And now I knew based on what people were telling me that they were not consuming hardly any calories that they needed. Yet what I was seeing with these people is not like a little increase. They would burn 500 calories, 600 calories, 700 calories higher. And their fat burning percentages would be like 90%. And it would be like, wow, like this is incredible. Your body is chewing through calories and it's doing so through fat. So I think you better eat at least like 2,600 calories or 2,600 calories. And the people doing the fasting would look at me and be like, what, what do you want me to eat? I can't eat that many calories. I'm eating eggs and steak and I feel really good. My energy's great. I certainly don't want to crash my metabolism, but now I'm not that hungry. So I started fasting and, and it blew my mind. I couldn't figure out why these people would consume less calories, yet their metabolic rate would go gangbusters. And it took me a long time to understand what was going on. Can you explain what's going on there? Absolutely. So fasting is another great tool in the kit, not suitable for everyone, particularly if you're not metabolically flexible. That's why... Um, that therapeutic carbohydrate restriction goes so well with that fasting is because it enables them to burn their fat. So they're not getting that starvation. They're not getting that hungry. They're not feeling really crappy. Um, so essentially what's happening in the early days of fasting is you're starting to access your fat stores. So as I said, in a metabolically healthy person, you should switch to your burning of your fat after about four hours. Some people, it does take longer. So when you do that, as I said, the body says, hey, I've got ample fuel here. It's good. I don't need to eat as much. Then the more you prolong it, so the 24 to 48-hour period, um, which is sometimes the toughest, particularly if people are doing prolonged fast, which if you do decide to do under medical supervision but is an option, is you start to get the, the hormones like growth hormone, noradrenaline. So some people might feel running a little bit hotter um, because there's a hormonal response. And that's why although people fear that they're going to slow their metabolic rate, sometimes it's the opposite due to these hormonal responses. Um, also, a further reduction in insulin, one thing to be weary of. Because you're not eating, it also means you're not getting electrolytes and salt. So if you're feeling a little bit more tired or shaky or performance reduces, people assume it might be the food, but it may actually be the salt and the electrolytes, so magnesium and just adding a bit of sodium. Me personally, I add it to my coffee because it takes away the bitterness. People think I'm weird, but there's various ways to go about it. And same with athletes um, is with that fasting, generally they can and many choose to, for example, uh, fast um, during their endurance type training to get sp some specific changes in the enzymes um, for their performance and aerobic capacity as well. So essentially, they're not eating high fat, 
but they're having a high fat diet from their own body. But if that's not enough, uh, particularly, as you say, is for the general population, they don't need to over consume. But athletes, they might be the ones that might need to, example, increase their um, energy intake by the likes of fluids, you know, your coconut creams, um, that fat dense energy foods, if they find their performance is reducing, they might need to uh, change that up. So hopefully yeah. I didn't go off on too many tangents there. That was a great point. No, I absolutely love that. I have to just interject. I put salt in my coffee too. I add it with my MCT oil, a little bit of butter. People think I'm weird as well, but it tastes amazing. And I know the second, like if I forget to add it some mornings, it tastes terrible now. I, like I thought it was weird at first, but now like if I don't have it, it tastes awful. Yeah. So you're not alone. But yeah, no, that's right. And if anybody has any questions about, you know, where the science shows this, I would recommend they go back and, and check out some of the studies that George Cahill was doing back in the 1960s. We'll probably never be able to replicate where he was showing what is happening to the body as you fast it for longer and longer. And one study in particular, he was fasting people for 40 days, people that had lots of fat to lose, and it showed how the different tissues in the body changed. So where some tissues needed super high amounts of glucose, where you can't store very much of it, that's not going to work. But the body fat adapts, the keto adapts. And once it starts, you know, using ketones as fuel, now you are running on your stored fat, which is why the metabolic rate can go so high. When the insulin's low, it just says, wow, well, here's the food. We already stored all of this. Let's get this all out of here. And so, yeah, I, I feel like that was very, very well explained. Through this conversation, we have mentioned other lifestyle factors. I think nutrition is the number one thing that we should be talking about when we're talking about metabolism. I think that changes metabolism the most. But let's just give a little recap of what other things we could be talking about as far as lifestyle changes across, generally across the board that most people could do to improve their metabolism. Being an exercise physiologist, I'm not going to neglect the role of exercise, particularly for weight loss maintenance. Um, as we've talked about, is a lot of people do cardio, which, as I said, does have some benefits, but there is some ramifications depending on what their resting metabolism is doing. But I find an area people are neglecting is resistance-based training to maintain that muscle for all the reasons we mentioned before. Now, I'm not talking about going to the gym and pumping weights, particularly for the overweight population, is walking might be enough because they've got all that weight weighing them down for the legs. But they not need to be doing a, a wall press up against a wall or, um, you know, some things at home using TheraBands. Um, ben Bacuccio, an exercise physiologist, you can really work those muscles to fatigue to get some really dramatic health and also muscle benefits from doing so. Um, that would be my main point around exercise. Then we talked about sleep. So, for example, we touched on sleep apnea before is it's really important to get tested and yes weight loss can help but you might just need to go on a sleep apnea machine which is not very nice but it can really help as i said is get your body burning fat so you can lose the weight so that you can essentially come off it we had a look at um we have a look at neck circumference in the clinic and we know that those with sleep apnea self-diagnosed sleep apnea they ticked it on our questionnaire self-reported shall i say not self-diagnosed is they can get improvements. So you can reduce your neck circumference because we can store fat around our tongue. So once again, burning fat is key. Um, you can lose weight and you can improve that metabolic flexibility. So can't neglect sleep. Um, also that the stress, as I said, busy mums and grandparents and, as I said, guys with jobs and those sorts of things, stress is always going to be there, uh, but the likes of Meditation now, we're even seeing some data about saunas and cold therapy, the hormetic stress of those changing the way our brown fat, which is something we have more of as babies, changes. Um, you know, so there's a lot of tools in the kit. Similar to we might use more in our toolkit, whether we're working on a carb, spanners and all that get used a lot. For me, that's low carbohydrate diets and fasting and exercise, but there's so much more than that. Um, so, for example, um, supplements is another one. Um, if you're on a statin, for example, it reduces something called coenzyme Q10. Now, that is really important for heart health, the way the enzymes work in the cells. So you might want to go on a supplement for coenzyme Q10 if, if you and your health practitioner choose to stay on the statin. You've also got something like vitamin D. 
you know, we spend so much time indoors, we've got problems with our liver, we might not get enough vitamin D. Obviously, we want to increase that naturally by the sunlight, getting foods that support its um, transport, so fatty foods, it's a fat-soluble vitamin, but also there's been some studies, for example, in women that those who are low, if they supplement with vitamin D, do generally get better results. And one that um, Ben Bickman, a physiologist in America, has recently had a look at for those with PCOS is inositol for PCOS, looking at the way that instead of metformin, which might be common prescription, the way that changes the way metabolism works in those individuals. So, as I said, plenty of other aspects, but I think the base of the pyramid is definitely lifestyle and nutrition. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I wanted to shape this conversation more around, you know, resting metabolic rate and the resting test that you do. I, I would like to talk a little bit about um, an exercise version of that test. I, I understand you guys don't do that as frequently, but what do you use the information from that for? We, I personally don't actually do that, the oh. exercise test at all. Gotcha. And the reason, the reason is, is when you think about metabolic parts is they can be like a dual cab ute. So a lot of them do resting and exercise, but do both not as good as if you focus on one or the other. So because of the sensor ranges and the specificity of the test. Um, in saying that, at university, obviously using that to have a look at where someone's fat threshold are in terms of training zones, um, so zone two training, pediatria and the likes of those guys go a lot of information on on finding that area so that you're not building up, um, you know, all that lactic acid and ROS, but can get a lot of training benefits, particularly aerobically. Yeah, no, well explained. So so when we would do the test, people would be really interested to see what their VO2 score is. And <laughs> VO2 is very, very important. It's one of the, the number one indicators of someone's longevity. But everybody exactly. everybody forgets. It drives me crazy. Everybody forgets that VO2, the number that you're used to seeing, is a relative score to your weight. And so if your score is really low, it either means you can't take in oxygen very well, or it means that you have a lot of body weight. So that might be the key indicator in morbidity. It might not be the oxygen oxygen delivery is probably that you might be like three or 400 pounds and you've got other things associated with it. People forget that part. And I, I, you know, it I drives me crazy, but, but yes, that was our favorite thing to use it for was to show people how to do proper zone two training and where that training should be kind of heart rate wise, which really lined up very well with the work of Dr. Phil Maffetone. Are you familiar with the math equation? With the heart rate zones and those sorts yeah. of things? it lined up like weirdly accurately almost every single time. So again, if somebody out there is listening and they don't have access to one of these metabolic carts, you look up the math equation. We've interviewed him as well. You will be very close to your maximum fat burn. And we would show people like, look, you don't store very many calories from carbohydrates, like we said earlier. But we'd also show somebody based on their body weight and their body fat percentage, how many calories of fat that they would store. That number could be hundreds of thousands of calories, depending on somebody's adiposity, how, how much body fat they had. And, and we got a lot of success, not only with fat loss for exercise, but also for endurance training. For an endurance athlete, it is your super high priority not to run out of glycogen when you are doing your event. This is why we invented things like Gatorades and goos and carbo loading, like you mentioned earlier. All these very high carbohydrate foods designed to like top off the, the sugar burning that you're, you're doing. The problem is it's getting in your stomach. It feels terrible. And eventually you're going to run out of sugar. So if we can flip that as you're exercising also and get you in the proper zone, now you're burning fat and you're preserving glucose. So you can go much further in endurance sports. Absolutely. Um, Volek and Fani, um do some great work in this area, particularly in athletes. Um, and, you know, sometimes some of the data and the research doesn't give athletes long enough to adapt. So it's not representing what truly happens in a fat adapted state. But when that occurs, when, you know, your body is metabolically flexible, you can burn fat, you actually burn fat majority of the race and you save that glycogen, as you say, for an uphill or the end sprint to prevent that, as they call it, um, the bonking or hitting the wall. So once again is also if that happens, electrolytes can be key as opposed to carbohydrates, which they might think in um, some studies is the issue, but you really get some really great adaptions at a cellular level 
um, given enough time to really help with that endurance and performance as well. Given enough time. Thank you for bringing that up. It annoys me when I see a study was done. It was four weeks long. Performance decreased on a higher fat, lower carbohydrate diet. Like, of course, it's going to decrease. You need months sometimes, maybe even a year if you've been doing high carbohydrate diets to really adapt. But when you do, it's it's amazing. Like, you, you don't bonk. Like, I can go out on a three-hour bike ride and ride pretty hard. And, like, there's no drop in my energy. And I don't need to eat anything. I hardly even take a water bottle with me. It could be the middle of the summer. It's amazing how the body adapts to burning fat. Yeah, exactly. And as you say, from a performance perspective, less gut issues, less stops, depending on what sort of race um, that you're in. So all those little things can help with performance. One less stress, one less thing to worry about bringing with you. Exactly. Exactly. I love it. You're already carrying the fat with you. Why not just eat your own fat during the race, just like you did for breakfast? I love yep. it. Uh, I could talk about this for hours with you. Um, but to wrap up, what are some things you guys are working on for the future? You guys have a lot of exciting things going on there. Yeah, absolutely. One of our biggest projects at the moment is, um, you know, you and I are very lucky to have access to such these tools to help manage patients. Um, but that comes with experience. So what we're working on at the moment is a metabolic platform, which we call Enable. And what that means is what we ideally want is for someone to be able to use um, the indirect calorimeter eCal, which is a cut. It's nice and simple to use. If I can use it, it's not that technologically advanced, I like to think but essentially generate a report based on that, which already generates a report with the results, but based on others' experience, what recommendations were given, what sort of results to expect um, using a metabolic type twin so that we can help more individuals, essentially. Um, so you go to a GP's office. It can be like a, G a blood pressure cuff, removing that guesswork so that we can access more people by using this metabolic platform divined by professionals so they can get that support um, and once again validate their inter interventions and help motivate the patient as well by knowing what to expect and knowing what else they can try if it's not working because there is not that one size fits all approach. Sure. Um, that's a, the big one for uh, metabolic health solutions. Personally, I'm also doing some Alzheimer's research, um, which, as I said, the opportunity came up because it was kind of linked with metabolism, but the more I go down that route is the more and more I realise the metabolic links. You know, we talked about adding MTC oil um, to the coffee because that can pass a blood-brain barrier, become a fuel, have some impacts there. So once again, um, never stopping to learn and really excited for the future, hopefully getting this message out. What other areas uh, aren't we really looking into? Um, I'm hopefully going to get a paper out this year looking at retrospectively looking at some of our data to really say, hey, this can actually be used in the real world with some life-changing impact, transforming lives, not only in terms of weight loss, but those other things that people report um, and, you know, continuing to delve into. I had a, a patient the other day with idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Once again, looked into it, metabolic link. So, um, you know, the world is our oyster, I think. That's amazing. I love that attitude of always trying to learn and improve and grow. And these are such wonderful tools that we can use to really help people and change their lives. So I really appreciate this conversation. I really take, appreciate you taking the time to join us today. Where would you like people to go to find you and connect with you and your work? Um, so one of my main points where I put up case studies and all of the latest research in terms of this sort of technology is Twitter, which is low carb EP um, for the clinics. Uh, so a little bit more patient directed MHS clinics on Facebook. Um, and uh, feel free um, if you want to pop my email in the show notes. If someone, um, as I said, we're based in Australia, but we also have affiliates in UK and Australia. And if you do want this sort of testing and it might not be available um, with ECAL, uh, the university or searching indirect calorimetry um, or metabolism testing is a great way to start, but making sure you want to get the gold standard test, not, not one of the equations. Um, and yeah, I think that's it. And also for any practitioners, um, Campbell Mordock did a really good um, resource for mainly practitioners but also patients about metabolic health so we can link that in the show notes 
And for those who are looking to start their own journey, I just want to say you don't need to be great to start, but you need to start to be great. And those who are already on a journey, don't quit now because when you started, you would have loved to be where you're at. So just remember how far you've come as well. Non-scale That's- victories. I love that. That's amazing advice. This has been an amazing conversation. Kirsty Woods, thank you so very much for all of your work. And thank you for sharing your insights and your time with us today. We really appreciate you. Not a problem. It's been a lot of fun. And an hour definitely goes quickly when you're talking about things you're passionate about. Very, very quickly. Well, we really appreciate it. And this has been another episode of Balanced Body Radio.